We move now beyond the rather narrowly focused concerns of generative linguistics, which has occupied the bulk of the academic study of language in the second half of the 20th century. Language, broadly construed, is infinitely ri richer than we can recognize using only these narrow frameworks of syntax, semantics, morphology, and phonology. One reason that language has become central to the concerns of cognitive science is because of the apparent link one might establish between what we call thought and language. This takes on a broader significance when we recognize, of course, that one of the roles that language is called upon to play is to explain what happens to our human species in the time since we evolved from the last common ancestor of humans, chimps and bonobos. If there were some evolutionary change in that sequence, it seems to have uh, provided enormous advantages in some respect, allowing us to take over and perhaps destroy the planet. Um, so if I was to ask you, why does language exist? Why, what, what's the point of language? You'd probably come up with the notion that language is for communication, and that is the focus of the generative approach, which tries to identify the formal characteristics of the code used for communication. And communication happens between individuals, of course. It doesn't happen within a single individual, it happens between individuals. Thinking, however, is a different matter. Thought, as represented there in the statue by Rodin, is something we often appear to do on our own, in silence, with no obvious physical activity going on, cut off from the world. And yet language seems to play a role here too. So, Let's be clear about one thing. Thinking does not have a definition, no more than mind. So when we talk about thought, thought or thinking, we're on thin ice and we need to be careful. It seems acceptable to a lot of people to understand some of what we, in an everyday sense, think of as thinking as being language-like. We conduct inner monologues, we discuss things with ourselves, sometimes we even think out loud using language. Um, if we were to recognize that thinking is a broad term defying any kind of finite description, and just to focus on what we might characterize as language-like thought, there's a question to be asked whether the overt language we use in communication is the same thing or is related to this use of language on our own silently. Um, later we'll meet the developmental psychologist Lev Vygotsky and one of his principal contributions was to observe that a lot of what we think of as our cognitive capacities do not have their origin in a private inner domain, but rather emerge first between people in a social context and later become internalized. And in his most famous work, he noted that this seems to be true of speech as well. That is that little children, when they're learning language, learning to speak in language, are actually thinking out loud. And there, this, acquisition of the ability to converse, to speak out loud, bifurcates then later. Um, and at some stage, they learn to suppress the overt expression of their thoughts. Um, and this developmental sequence would suggest that if you're thinking in language, that is a later development of a common origin for public language use between people and private language use within one's head, as it were. Now, 
thinking, as I said, resists a definite description and nobody has ever managed to characterize it in any way that would make us happy. Um, but some of our thought processes seem to be language-like, but they, they're not uncontroversially language-like. So you may choose to examine your own patterns of thought and find that the language-like elements are perhaps somewhat idiosyncratic, built up of years of habit and shorthand, compressed, fragmented. If you're thinking things over in your own mind, you don't need to think in full sentences. Jerry Fodor, who worked closely with Noam Chomsky, was very influenced by generative grammar and the formal properties of sentences that were being uncovered in the linguistic tradition that studies the structure of the code. And he suggested that we could take that model and understand inner thought in the same way. He referred to this internal language as mentalese, directly by comparison with things like Chinese. Um, that caused a lot of controversy. A lot of people felt that what they wanted to call thought was not captured by this. And the idea that thought bears a strong relationship to sentences um, ignited one of the most heated and, it must be said, ongoing debates within cognitive science. Um, about the degree to which any thinking is language-like. And language here tends to take on a specific meaning that has its roots also in uh, logic and philosophy, which is that sentence, some sentences are clearly, seem to be, about the world to describe states of affair that are either true or false. We come back to the silly kind of examples that linguists like to use, John kicked the ball, or the cat sat, the cat is on the mat. Um, those kinds of sentences are called propositions, if you can attach a truth value to them. And so the question of how much of cognition is propositional has um, sparked a furious debate. One of the attract attractions of the view of thought as language-like is that we are capable of forming elaborate plans and intentions whose very complexity seems to need the scaffold of language. So when I was a kid, it wasn't unknown for children to climb over the walls of orchards and go in and rob some apples. Luckily, the statute of limitations has passed. And so here's the kind of thought that might have been going through our heads as we stood at the back of an orchard. If three of us sneak in the back, we can steal at least a bag of apples without getting caught. Now, if we, I don't know if this is a thought that anyone actually had. It seems plausible to, de to describe the process of planning to rob an orchard in this fashion. But that particular sentence is extremely complex. If you look at it, it's got a conditional. So if three of us sneak in the back. So that's posits at least two different possible futures, one in which we do and one in which we don't. It's got number in there, three. Um, it's got counterfactuals. It, contained, it considers getting caught and by implication also not getting caught, as well as exact numerical quantities like three of us. We've got at least a bag of apples, so an approximate numerical quantity. Uh, it's got modality. We can. It's in the realm of possibility. This is a very complicated thought. It's expressed very well in language. And the, the, the idea, one of the attractions of the idea of mental lease is that it seems impossible to have a thought like this unless it's structured like language. But this, of course, raises lots of questions. If your thoughts are language-like, if you're a native speaker of English, are they in English? Can you think in other languages? That may not seem a difficult question to answer. What if I ask you, are they in your voice or are they in a particular voice? Do they have an accent? You're not normally aware of your own accent. Can you have a thought in the 
um, fake Scottish accent of Willie the groundskeeper from The Simpsons, for example. Or what about this one? When you're reading a text, there's words and meaning. Is there a voice intervening? When you're reading a text, are you internally speaking the words? These questions don't have clear answers, but they should um, encourage you to think about the relationship between thinking generally considered and specific kinds of thinking and your own experience. Now, we suggested that language might allow us to have such complex thoughts. That is, it would allow us to plan and act in the world in ways that we couldn't without language. And this may be the reason that the development of language within our species ultimately birthed complex modern societies, agriculture, settlements, right up to modern technology and colonialism and the whole shebang. So we, we lay a lot at the, on the shoulders of, of language. There's some interesting stuff to suggest that um, we can demonstrate that even the rudiments of language allow you to accomplish something that you couldn't do without the rudiments of language. And by the rudiments of language, I'm going to take an example from ape cognition, as reported in Andy Clark's book, Supersizing the Mind. And this concerns two chimpanzees. There's Sheba and Sarah. And Sheba does not have command of language, but she has a minimal sort of step on the way in that she has learned numerals like the number seven, or five. These she understands, and she understands quantity, so she knows the link between numbers and quantity. And now the trainers play a rather mean game with Sarah and Sheba. They repeatedly do the following exercise. They bring out two plates of treats and put them in front of Sheba. And the rule of the game, which the chimpanzees learn very quickly, is that whichever plate Sheba points to, Sarah gets. Now, the plates always have an unequal number of treats on them, and it's to be assumed that Sheba would like to get the plate with most treats on them. However, when the plates simply contain the treats, Sheba can't help herself. She seems to be caught in the flow of desire, the appetite, and she always points to the plate with the most treats. And then Sarah gets it, and Sheba gets distressed. Now we can repeat the experiment, but this time we won't show the treats directly. We'll, they'll be covered over, like in a fancy restaurant, and have big numbers on the outside, numerals. Now, Shiva understands numerals, and she knows then that these refer to the quantities underneath the lids. But with this small change, she can now master the task. She now points to the one with the smaller quantity, which goes to Sarah, and Shiva gets the greater amount of treats. So somehow this intervention between the treats and her pointing, the intervention of the numerals, gives her a way to distance herself from the situation, to remove herself from the flow of desire and appetite, and to achieve a goal, getting more treats, that seems to be not possible without this intervention. So here we have a just a suggestive uh, study which suggests that we can actually accomplish things using very rudimentary fragments of language, numerical symbols, that we couldn't do otherwise. So using labels, naming things, having numeric quantities that we can express symbolically, this changes the set of problems that we can master. And language here appears as a kind of a tool, or in Andy Clark's Vocabulary, we could say language is a kind of a scaffolding for higher cognition. It enables us to go on and do all kinds of feats, precisely because it provides certain kinds of structure, the kinds of structure that organize that complex thought about robbing an orchard. So Jerry Fodor suggested this term mental lease in a book called The Language of Thought. And the Language of Thought hypothesis suggests that mental processes are computational processes defined over representations. Let's talk about those terms. By mental processes, he means whatever is going on, presumably inside the head, 
that allows us to grasp the world, to exhibit mastery over the world, in short, cognition, to apprehend the world and act on it. By computational processes, he's referring specifically to a much narrower conception in which we are talking about rule-based transformations of orderings of symbols. That is, of course, at the heart of generative grammar and by extension is now being suggested as a model for the internal workings of a cognitive system. These symbols themselves are representations and they are assumed to stand for something. I come back to that notion of specific kinds of sentences, which we might call propositions, which seem to be about the world. So these symbols symbolize or depict or are about external things. I'm not sure what an internal thing is. So there you go. And this provides an awful lot of the structure with which the computational theory of mind was then elaborated. Uh, the computational theory of mind is, comes then to be largely concerned with identifying the kinds of representations used in thought that are assumed to mediate between the world and cognition. Just as the numerals mediated between the treats and the decision to point one way or the other. Now we'll be brushing off the computational theory of mind a lot in this module, and it should be borne in mind that it is a theory and that there are alternative frameworks. It's often spoken of particularly by those who are fond of it as if this were simply known to be the way the mind works. We don't know any such thing. We don't know what the mind means. And this is a well-elaborated theory, but it is one of a number of options. So here's some questions just to round this out for you to think about. I don't know if you've ever thought about what thinking is and whether you are would be happy with the characterization of thought as language-like. So are all thoughts expressed in words? Are thoughts individual things? Is thinking a clearly defined process? And if you have, if you see a role in your inner economy for language-like thoughts, are those thoughts that you could not think without language? And then how much else goes on inside your head? I certainly am not going to offer you answers to this, but you might ask yourself whether thought exhausts what we might want from a theory of mind. 